On the side of a builder's yard in the Ari city of Limerick, there's a neglected track. It leads to a place which evokes terrible memories. I was shown one vast grave on the outskirts of the city, near the poorhouse, into which nearly 2,000 bodies had been gathered in less than a month. The cross stands on a mass grave, just one of thousands scattered all over Ireland. Such memorials bear stark testimony to one of the greatest tragedies in Irish history. Oh, no, I Somalia, 1993. At least 300,000 people died, most of them children. We may feel compassion and send a little money to charity, but these days famine is something which only afflicts brown people in faraway places. It hasn't happened in most of Europe for hundreds of years, except in Ireland, where events just as terrible, just as harrowing, took place only two lifetimes ago. Dead, uncoffined, naked, funerals consisting only of the cart driver and someone to help in putting the bodies into the grave. As for the little children, they seem to me to be all stunted in their growth and bearing as close a resemblance as possible to unfledged birds. The same morning, the police opened a house on the adjoining land, which was observed shut for many days, and two frozen corpses were found, lying upon the mud floor, half devoured by rats. But why should the Irish, alone of all the peoples in the Western world, have been so vulnerable to the horrors of famine? Part of the answer is that in 1845, a third of the population were entirely dependent on one crop, the potato. The climate in the west of Ireland is mild and wet, too wet for crops like wheat to do well. For thousands of years, a small population depended on oatmeal and cattle. But then came the wonder crop. <clears throat> the splendiferous spud. One of nature's greatest inventions, full of nutrition. It's got carbohydrate, it's got protein, it's got lots of vitamins. It's a bit weak on vitamin A, so we put in some buttermilk. Or if there's some greens handy, that will also do the job. A man can live on potatoes perfectly easily. And in the 19th century, in Ireland, the poor would eat up to 14 pounds of spuds a day. That's a stone. There was a problem with the potato. One problem, the problem of storage. Potatoes can only be stored for up to six months, or nine at a stretch. So that between May, when the harvest was exhausted, and October, when the new potatoes were coming in, the Irish went a bit hungry every year. There was a seasonal dearth of food in the summer. Despite the seasonal food shortage, the population more than doubled in less than a hundred years. <laughs> 
By 1845, derelict hillsides like this one in County Mayo were teeming with people. The people have all gone and sheep have taken their place, but the potato ridges are still there. Those ridges would indicate tremendous pressure on the land because I think Bowen has to be under great pressure to be up here at all, tilling this land. There's so much rock and there's so much stone. It certainly isn't the best land for cultivation, and yet there is intensive cultivation here. Um, all these plots of, of ridges, and the height of those ridges, I think some of them were never dug out. There is an indication that crops were planted here and never gave any return. But the interesting thing is that in grassland and in the pastoral tradition, that you've had 200 generations of that and then relatively recent in looking at the whole perspective of Irish agriculture you had this wonder food which came in from America the potato it allowed for a tremendous crops to be taken off tiny plots of uh, tiny plots of ridges it gave this tremendous crop it meant that you had a massive explosion of population but then disaster hit and possibly what we're looking at is that moment of disaster when this wonder crop showed that there was a negative side to it as well. There had been failures of the potato harvest before, but until the autumn of 1845, crop disease or bad weather had only affected some districts and had rarely lasted more than a single season. In September 1845, Farmers in many different districts all over Ireland noticed signs of a new disease on the leaves of the potato plants. It was blight, accidentally imported from America into Europe. Reports on the harvest from different parts of the country vary greatly. The disease is by no means as far spread as was supposed, and the crops so overabundant that the partial failure will be the less felt. Hunger will, I fear, soon commence among near one million of our people. The British government, which then controlled affairs all over Ireland, thought that the Irish were exaggerating as usual. But the Prime Minister, Sir Robert Peel, knew Ireland well and was alert to the danger of famine. He set up a scientific commission to investigate the causes of blight and to try and find some remedy. But scientific knowledge wasn't far enough advanced and the Commission's recommendations were all useless. Ireland's population was then a booming nine million, with up to three million people utterly dependent on potatoes. Clearly there was an urgent need for a substitute food. Maize was the cheapest available. It was known as Indian corn. Peel set up small stores of Indian corn in all the most impoverished districts. The idea wasn't to give it away, but to sell it at a low price and so keep down the cost of food. Irish grain merchants were enraged by this interference in free trade and complained bitterly about a threat to their profits. The problem for the poor was that they had no money with which to buy food at any price. So the government set up public works where men could earn about eight pence a day, just enough to keep their families alive. The work should be as repulsive as possible, consistent with humanity. That is, paupers would rather do the work than starve. By labouring on the roads and by selling the last of their possessions, most poor people survived one famished winter. They would not survive another. In the summer of 1846, there was fresh trouble about free trade in food. At the time, farmers in England and Eastern Ireland enjoyed high prices for grain because of heavy tariffs on foreign imports. Peel wanted to reform these corn laws and so reduce the price of food, but he was bitterly opposed by many landowners in his own party. He got the measure through, but his government fell and was replaced by the Liberals, then known as the Whigs. Even today, 
governments are all too ready to impose their economic policies as if they were some form of holy writ. That was certainly true in the summer of 1846 when the Whigs acceded to power. Their accession was a disaster for Ireland because it put responsibility for Irish affairs in the hands of men who believed passionately in free trade. They believed passionately in that trade and didn't want to meddle with market forces unless it were absolutely necessary. The new Whig Prime Minister, Lord John Russell, was a devotee of free trade and knew little of Irish affairs. And the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Sir Charles Wood, was bigoted in his views. Many other English MPs also regarded private enterprise as sacrosanct and were rigidly opposed to government interference in the marketplace. I do not think the way to raise the condition of the people is to give relief from any public fund. It is clear that the Irish pauper does not like work. I object to the principle of taxing the people in this country to relieve the distress of Ireland. These were also the views of Charles Trevelyan, the civil servant in charge of Irish famine relief. He was devout, narrow-minded, and convinced that God and market forces were on the same side. He saw uh, the famine as uh, a visitation of God, uh, as a way of solving uh, a very serious overpopulation problem. And uh, he believed that by and large, uh, the government shouldn't intervene very much, uh, because in the long run, that would uh, make things uh, even worse. If the Irish uh, weren't taught a lesson or didn't learn a lesson, uh, in the late 1840s, then who knows, in the 1850s or the 1860s, uh, the same was going to happen again, and they would have to go through perhaps even a worse catastrophe. Uh, now, that was the way uh, Trevelyan uh, thought. Uh, critics argued that uh, people who are starving needed food, not lessons in what was known in those days as political economy. Uh, Trevelyan was very well-intentioned, but uh, uh, not a very humane man. And uh, the, the atti his attitudes um, were responsible for, uh, undoubtedly, for uh, lots of deaths. In the summer of 1846, the potato crop promised a bumper harvest, and many people believed the danger of famine was over. But they were wrong. On the 27th of last month, I passed from Cork to Dublin, and this doomed plant bloomed in all the luxuriance of an abundant harvest. Returning on the third instant, I beheld with sorrow one wide waste of putrefying vegetation. the crop, I smelt the fearful stench, now so well recognized as the death sign of each field of potatoes. I saw my splendid crop fast disappearing and melting away under this fatal disease. Stress and fear was in every countenance. There was a great rush to dig and sell, or consume the crop by feeding pigs or cattle, fearing in a short time they would prove unfit for any use. For many months, the government refused to reopen the stores of Indian corn, convinced that nothing should disrupt the free market in food. The result was widespread starvation. I confess myself unmanned by the extent of the suffering I witnessed. More especially amongst the women and the little children, crowds of whom were seen to be scattered over the fields like a flock of famishing crows, 
mothers uttering exclamations of despair whilst their children were screaming with hunger. They passed through three stages. At first they faced starvation manfully, too proud to accept grudged help. Then they were mad with despair. Then they were full of hopeless resignation. The hunger is on us. Tis the will of God. The will of God be done. Descriptions written at the time are haunting. But for me, what brings the famine closest is the fact that there are still people alive today whose grandparents survived the tragedy. A few of these old people, like Tom Guilty, remember the stories they first heard in childhood. They lived down here, Thomas McFadden. He walked across that mountain every day and watched for one turn up a day. And came home with a turn up at night. That man, he lived to be 101 years. He's buried over there in the graveyard. And he was one day on the Mealand Road with a cartload of potatoes. And there was a lot of women and kids begging a few of them. And he was throwing them a few, like here and there. And the landlord caught him. So the landlord put a different man the next day with the cart, his brother Dick. But there was ten times more people the next day waiting for Dick. And Dick's orders were to give no potatoes away. But um, they were all in the road and Dick couldn't get through. And they all gathered round the cart. And they tipped the load of potatoes up on the road and took the whole lot from Dick. Oh, the pretties, they are small Over here, over here Oh, the pretties, they are small Oh, the pretties, they are small And we dig them in the fall And we ate them skins and all Over The famine affected the whole of Ireland, but it was most terrible in the West, where most people still spoke the Irish language. Bab Fertier tells the story of a poor woman who had just buried her daughter and then called on a neighbour's house. Oh, the pretties, they are small And we dig them in the fall mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Irish people have always attached great importance to the ceremony surrounding death. But there were so many deaths at the time of the famine that wakes and funerals were forgotten and coffins almost unobtainable, even for a much-loved child. Tom was a child during the famine, of about two or three years old, and he got the famine fever, and they thought he was dead. So they were about to take him away and bury him without a coffin. But his aunt, who was very fond of the child, wouldn't allow that. She, she insisted that she should get some box to put him into. And she searched around, and eventually she got a box. But when she tried to put him into the box, she found his legs were too long. So she disjointed his two knees and turned his legs up beside his hips, you see, and got him into the box. He was buried then. And when the next funeral came to the place, they heard some noise in the box. And they opened it, and they found the child was alive inside. Goodness. And he was able to live, you see, because there was sufficient air in the box to keep him going until the next funeral came. But his legs never straightened again. He said himself, one of his legs faced east and the other faced west. You see, they were uh, about half a right angle out that way. And he walked on the side of his feet. But a father dear, a day will come in answer to my call. When Irish men 
fight again and we'll rally one and all. As time went by, Irish people who might at first have accepted the famine as the will of God came increasingly to see it as caused by the British government. This old song cries out for vengeance. At the time of the famine, Ireland was technically part of the United Kingdom under the terms of the Act of Union of 1801. But despite the apparent prosperity of cities like Dublin, there was little industrial development and Ireland was effectively a British colony, a source of food and raw materials and a convenient market for English goods. Most of the wealth was in the hands of a small minority of Protestants. The Roman Catholics, who made up three quarters of the population, had suffered harsh discrimination for much of the previous 200 years. In many parts of the country, priests still sometimes say mass in the open air in memory of those times. Supper was ended, he took the cup. Again he gave you thanks and praise. Gave the cup to his disciples and said, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. This is the cup of my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant. It will be shed for you and for all, so that sins may be forgiven. Do this in memory of me. Under the so-called penal laws, Irish Catholics weren't allowed to hold office in government. They couldn't buy or sell land. In theory, they couldn't even go to school unless they turned Protestant. By 1829, all these laws had been repealed, but by that time religious discrimination had come to be seen by many people as part of the hated colonial process. The Anglican Church of Ireland was only attended by about one-seventh of the population. Catholics resented the Church of Ireland because although they never entered its precincts, they were forced to help to pay for it. It was also, of course, the religion of the ruling classes. 80% of the land was in the hands of the Anglo-Irish gentry, the descendants of English adventurers who'd been granted lands in Ireland in the 17th century. This is Colonel John Brown, who was the founder of the estate here in about uh, 1690. And this is the marble staircase here, which was put in by Italians in about... Many landlords were absentees. Others were permanent residents. Some were brutal and arrogant. Others tried to be benevolent. But all of them lived in another world from the ordinary Irish people. And here is the Angel of Welcome, one of the most beautiful statues. And it was a tr tradition that if you'd been away for a long time and you arrived back as one of the family, the first thing you'd do when you come into the house is to actually shake hands with the outstretched hand there of the angel. And up here especially you can see how the staircase is cantered, but it goes about... The evil of the system lay in the gross inequality in the distribution of land. Anglo-Irish landlords may have seemed all-powerful. A few of them were, but most sat at the top of a ramshackle pyramid of tenancies and sub-tenancies. The estates were often in debt, and most of the land was let on long leases to quite wealthy tenants. But at the bottom of the heap were hundreds of thousands of small sub-tenants. These usually rented their land from richer farmers from one year to the next, with no security, always in arrears of the rent. And these poor people tended to subdivide their land still further to make provision for their families. So you get uh, a dualistic uh, system where the better off farmers tend not to subdivide and so the uh, the inequality in the uh, distribution of land over time is becoming greater. Um, farms that are of 50 or 100 acres in say the year 1800 are still more or less like that in 1845 but farms of 10 acres many of them would have been divided into three of three acres or 
two or five acres or whatever. Another difference uh, is that on the bigger farms, uh, people tend to marry later. And where subdivision is occurring, uh, you get uh, early marriage and more frequent marriage. What you have is a society where there was, in some areas, quite a lot of vacant land available, which was only under very loose control. And basically, access to land was relatively easy, much easier for a young person without capital than in Britain or in a lot of other parts of Northern Europe at the time. And the, the importance of that is that, first of all, people could marry and set, set up home at a relatively early age. Secondly, the size of holdings could become quite small. The result is that by the 1840s you have a lot of people in Ireland living on very, very small holdings of land. So you have a very strange picture in Ireland where there's almost an inverse relationship between land fertility and population density. In other words, a lot of the smallest plots of land are on the worst quality soil. Many of the poorest farmers lived close to the sea, where they could get access to seaweed to fertilize their potatoes. To some English observers, there was something immoral about living off potatoes, and the poor Irishman was an object of scorn. A fortnight's planting, a week or ten days digging, suffice for his existence. During the rest of the year, he is at leisure to follow his own inclinations. The whole of them, with a few exceptions, are idle, reckless, lazy and improvident. But although this dependence on potatoes may seem to have been foolish, the poor Irish had little choice. Potatoes gave the highest return from the smallest plots of land. Except in parts of the east, wheat was out of the question, and if western farmers did raise a small plot of oats or barley, they almost always had to use it to pay the rent. A quarter of the population, well over two million people, survived by renting a plot of potatoes from year to year or by trading their labor for a small patch of land. These people lived in primitive cabins in the utmost squalor and poverty. As long as they were able to cut turf for their fires and had potatoes to eat, they could survive. In fact, they were surprisingly healthy and often had large families. This fecundity was one of many aspects of Irish rural life which offended the English. The Irish peasantry have a taste for rioting and whiskey, spent a large portion of their year on popish holidays and the usual crimes and absurdities of itinerant and local treason. Who can wonder if Pat continues poor? But English visitors were appalled by the depths of Irish poverty. A bed or a blanket is a rare luxury, and their pig and their manure heap constitute their only property. Before the famine, the British government decided that something must be done about the poorest of the poor. 130 workhouses were built where destitute people could take refuge at times of extreme want. The workhouses were paid for by rates levied on local landlords and tenant farmers. Conditions were made as harsh as possible to dissuade the Irish poor from sponging off the rates. They are led to their stalls for the night, where are pallets of straw in long rooms. They are sorted and ranged according to sex, to lie down together with neither light of the sun, moon or candle till the morning dawn to resume afresh the routine of the preceding day. As its name suggests, people were to work in the workhouse. They weren't to be idle. So men were usually set stone breaking. Women did the housework. The children went to school every day. The diet of the workhouse was deliberately to be monotonous and boring. And there was a strong disciplinary element as well. 
Treasury Secretary Trevelyan put it like this. Relief should be made so unattractive as to furnish no motive to ask for it, except in the absence of every other means of subsistence. This was one of the isolation cells in the workhouse. People got thrown in here for having drink or maybe tobacco, or who knows, maybe for trying to kiss their wife. And they were thrown in here for two or three days. The door was shut. There was no light. It was dank. It was cold. And quite frankly, standing here, I myself feel a chill in the soul. Of course, the British didn't feel charitable towards the Irish who were seen as treacherous beggars, always ready to shoot their English benefactors in the back, constantly plotting rebellion. In some cases, they were regarded almost as subhuman. There's an element of racist scorn in many cartoons of the period. Nor were the Irish always as charitable as they might have been towards their own people. Throughout the famine, the richer Catholic farmers continued to sell their cattle for export to England, even though their poorer countrymen were starving all around them. A later generation of nationalists was to see this as an example of deliberate English exploitation. In fact, it was just the unrestrained pursuit of profit. There was nothing to stop that food staying in Ireland. Um, it would have stayed in Ireland, presumably, if the farmers in question had got a higher price on the local markets than they got on the export market. Uh, nobody forced the food to leave the country. It didn't have to leave the country to pay rents either. Um, there was a common currency between the two countries. The rent could have been paid by food sold in Dublin just as well by food sold in Liverpool. Um, the reason the food didn't stay in Ireland is because the people who were starving didn't have the wherewithal to buy this food. Now, the alternative would have been for the government to compulsorily buy the food in the markets, but that would have caused a similar process of objection by the people selling it, who were mostly Irish, who were mostly Catholic, who were, by and large, not the landlords. They were the farmers. They were the middling ranks in Irish society. And they obviously wanted to get the maximum market price for what they were selling. If the government had paid maximum market prices, it would have been a matter of indifference to them. The Whig government also refused to interfere with the free market in wheat, barley and oats. Although there were large imports of maize, wheat continued to be exported to England throughout the famine, to the understandable fury of many Irish people. There had been crop failures throughout Europe, but other governments, Belgium, Russia, Alexandria, were importing food. They were um, closing their ports to export and they were actually providing bounties for food imported into their countries. The British government refused to do that and it very much left Ireland to free market forces. Unrestrained free trade meant that food was openly on sale at very high prices to those who could afford it within full sight of the starving people. This seems to me to be the ultimate obscenity of British government policy in the late 1840s. At the same time, thousands of people were dying of hunger. They went on the shore and every rock and every, every place you'd go was turned over with uh, looking for limpids and winkles. They had at everything. And then they started eating the seaweed, chopping it up and boiling it, and they died with dysentery and black fever and stalatine fever and yellow fever. They were dying every day later. The weather that winter was the worst on record. It was described as one continuous storm. So rude is their tackle, and so fragile and liable to be upset are their primitive boats, that they can only venture to sea in fine weather. And thus, with food almost in sight, the people starve. Not a fish was to be had in the town. Not a boat was at sea. 
After much delay, the government restarted the public works. This is a famine road in the Dingle Peninsula, and it's flanked by a wonderful wall. We know from some reports that men on the works dropped dead. They were starving, they were wretchedly dressed, and they were paid a pittance for their work, a pittance which sometimes never even arrived. Here we know that there was a ganger who was reasonably humane and allowed the men to go down to the shore to pick mussels and other shellfish. And some of these mussels are still lying on the road here today. The system, uh, as it operated in some places, tended to benefit uh, the strong and those who could work at the expense of those who couldn't. Um, and uh, in that sense, it was an inefficient uh, way of uh, providing relief. Again, it involved people working out in the open uh, in bad, bad clothes, in bad weather and so on. And that is not an ideal way of dealing with uh, people who are on the brink of dying. There was no other government relief available, so the Board of Works ended up by taking on women, old folk, even children. By February 1847, 750,000 people were employed, and many of them had several dependents. But wages were rarely more than eight pence a day, and with no restriction on food prices, the cheapest Indian corn rose to three pence a pound. While they worked, the people were slowly starving to death. What they were paid was probably adequate to keep a family alive in, say, September, October. By January, what they were paid was no longer adequate to buy sufficient food for that family. Yes, maybe you could pay them more, but the more you paid, the more you were taking people out of ordinary, everyday jobs, farm labourers, work, uh, work in the local towns, etc. I think basically the shock to the system, what happened in terms of food prices meant the public works didn't have a chance. In the spring of 1847, the public works were brought to an abrupt halt. This is a pile of stones that were going to be used to build a road, and they lie exactly where they left them 150 years ago. Some of the projects were good, others were futile. This is one of the futile ones. It would have been a road from nowhere to nowhere. When the public works were brought to an end, poor people had little hope of survival on the land. Some of their landlords did nothing. Others tried to help. He did everything he could, we believe, under the circumstances, to help in every way possible. Uh, he brought in a ship at the quay with grain on it for distribution. He kept the workhouse going uh, at his own expense, in fact, for quite a long time. He travelled the 26 counties, or 26 of the counties of Ireland, uh, consulting with all the appropriate people, trying to see if something could be done about the famine. And also, uh, they had a lot of guns and a lot of shot at that time when the famine begun, began itself. And uh, they went off over the hills, over the deer park, and they shot all the birds and the deer that they could shoot. And they brought them down into the great big enormous famine pots, which they boiled up great soups with. And they had lines of people that they gave out the soup to. From the early days of the famine, some local relief committees and private charities like the Society of Friends, the Quakers, ran soup kitchens where starving people were fed. The Mendicity Society in Dublin still serves free meals to all comers with no questions asked. 
just as it did at the time of the famine. Efforts like this finally roused Westminster into effective action. And by the summer of 1847, government soup kitchens were feeding three million people a day. But by then it was too late for the hundreds of thousands who had already died. In a desperate search for food, thousands of starving people poured into the towns. Here in Skibbereen was a government food store and a locally organized soup kitchen. The poor people came in from the rural districts in such numbers in the hope of getting some relief that it was utterly impossible to meet their most urgent exigencies. Any day that you would have come to this town in the winter of 1846-47, you would have seen approximately 8,000 people gathered here, outside the soup kitchen which stands behind me. Now, 8,000 people mightn't sound like much, but today, when 8,000 people go over there to the football pitch, we say there's a huge crowd in town. Here we're talking about 8,000 starving people coming in for food. Furthermore, the soup committee were sending out as many as 700 servings per day up to a distance of four miles out of town to those who actually couldn't come in because they hadn't the strength. In every famine, far more people die of disease than die of hunger alone. And when people flock in from the countryside in search of food, the danger of epidemics is greatly increased. This is as true today as it was in 1847. In the Ethiopian famine of 1984, great care was taken to try and ensure clean water supplies to prevent dysentery. The medical teams also had modern disinfectants and antibiotics for the treatment of disease. Even so, relief workers found that Ethiopian children in 1984 suffered from exactly the same diseases as the Irish children of 1847. Typhus is spread by a lice, an infected lice. And of course, as happened in the Irish famine, I understand, we had a lot of debilitated people gathered together, their clothes were dirty, and their heads were full of lice. And people who are sick and cold huddled together for warmth. And of course, that caused a, a lot of the spread of the infection at the time. So we were very concerned about the high numbers of people gathered together. I've read quite a bit about the famine, and the thing that continues to amaze me is the similarity. I mean, the diseases were exactly the same. Bacillary dysentery, typhus, pneumonia, and I'm certain, although I, I haven't read much about iron deficiency anemia, but I'm absolutely certain the anemia was gross in Ireland at that time. I don't know if much has been written about that, but I mean, it's a very important factor because it predisposed people to the various infections were going. The workhouses, which had been shunned before the famine, were now besieged by thousands of people begging for admission. Inevitably, the places of refuge became hotbeds of infection. Five hundred persons were admitted without any provision either of space or clothing to meet so fearful an emergency. All of them were suffering from famine and most of them from malignant dysentery or fever. Such a tangled mass of poverty, filth and disease as the applicants presented, I have never seen. Numbers in all stages of fever and smallpox and all clamoring for admission. The great majority of new admissions are when brought into the house at the point of death in a moribund state. It is a well-known fact that many dying persons are sent for admission merely that coffins be obtained for them at the expense of the Union. By the autumn of 1847, many workhouses were running out of money to feed and house or even to bury their wretched occupants. At this point, the British government washed its hands of the Irish problem. It brought in a new measure to make Irish property pay for Irish poverty. It was called the Poor Law Extension Act and was the brainchild of Treasury Secretary Trevelyan. <laughs> 
Trevelyan believed that Ireland's estates must be made more profitable, which meant getting rid of inefficient or debt-ridden landlords, like Major Dennis Mann, the owner of Strokestown Park. When Mann inherited the estate, it was £30,000, say between two and three million pounds at today's prices, in debt. From my own reading of the family's papers, it's obvious that Mann was in an impossible situation. None of his thousands of tenants had paid any rent for years. They were under threat not to do so from Molly Maguire's, the 1840s equivalent of paramilitary gangs. But the government's new act now made landlords responsible for the rates of all their poorer tenants. Mann himself was assassinated before the new act became law. But the problem remained for his successors. How could landlords pay the rates for thousands of poor tenants who were no longer paying them any rent? The answer was to evict them and destroy their houses. This was a brutal, almost a murderous business, but it wasn't entirely the landlord's fault. The effect of the government's new act was to force many landlords to evict all their poorer tenants or else go bankrupt. Other people on the estate were forbidden to shelter evicted tenants because if the homeless people remained on his land, the landlord would still be liable for their rates. The ditch side, the dripping rain, and the cold sleet are the covering of the wretched outcast the moment the cabin is tumbled over him. No country ravaged by a hostile army could have been reduced to a more deplorable condition. Whole districts are cleared. The torpor and apathy which have seized on the people are only surpassed by the atrocities committed by those who set the dictates of humanity and the decree of the Almighty at equal defiance. At least a million people died before the famine ran its course. The great majority of them Roman Catholics. They died in conditions of abject misery and degradation. For many of them, the only consolation was the Christian promise of life everlasting. It must have been that faith which enabled them in the end to face death with such extraordinary submissiveness. They passed through three stages. At first they faced starvation manfully, too proud to accept grudged help. Then they were mad with despair. Then they were full of hopeless resignation. The hunger is on us, tis the will of God, the will of God be done. The story of the Great Famine concludes next week here on BBC Two at 8 o'clock.